welcome to Galaxy Brains. The weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. I'm back to attack with another funky verse. I'm on track, on pace, and I'm not uncertain. We're talking today with the legend Jason Urban, 23. We get to be front row to destiny. These blow ups, that's the best you got to send to me. The bits and blocks keep going, tick and tock. And yo, I'll be talking shop till that final ball drops. Yo. As always, I'm your host, Alex Thorne, head of Firmwide Research at Galaxy Digital. Welcome to Galaxy Brains. We have a great show. Like I said, we are talking with Jason Urban, head of trading at Galaxy Digital. It's a great conversation. He's been trading in markets of all types for a long time. He's got some great stories to tell us about the old days in the pits in Chicago and much more. Um, and of course, we're going to talk with our friend Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Digital Trading about markets. Uh, but before we begin, I have to tell you, please refer to the link to the disclaimer in the podcast notes and note that none of the information in this podcast constitutes investment advice or a recommendation, offer or solicitation by Galaxy Digital or any of its affiliates to buy or sell any securities. We got that out of the way. I think we're ready to go. Let's get into it. Galaxy Brands. Let's go to our friend Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Digital Trading. Bimnet, good to see you, man. Thanks for having me on. As always, um, I guess markets have been. I mean, in crypto markets, where I, you know, where I start my day usually, um, uh, we've seen a sort of a grind higher, a slow grind higher over the last couple of days. That has been, you know, I think it, it welcomed by the market. Although I wouldn't say it's been super dramatic. Um, why? Yeah, honestly, it comes back down to, to memes. Yeah. Um, there was this meme project on Solana that launched uh, about a couple weeks ago called Bonk. Bonk. Um, and I have know, to say, I love the name. Oh, it's great. And there's a dog on on the <laughs> on the, on the photo. graphic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, people liked it. Uh, created um, you know enthusiasm amongst the the soul community. Uh, the reason why there's so much enthusiasm is because it started to rally a lot, and it rallied because it's a meme project, and there's a lot of zeros before and you've <laughs> after talked, the decimal and, point. Yeah, you've told and, me yeah. about the uh, like um, from such a low basis, right? That this um, what's the term that you like to use? Base effect. The, base effect. The base effect really at play here too. I mean, it, oh, absolutely. Solana was down dramatically after FTX. Exactly. I mean, just it, the the easiest example. Let's say something goes from you know a hundred dollars to one dollar. That's a ninety nine percent move. But if it goes from one dollar to two dollars afterwards, that's a hundred percent up. That's a hundred percent up. <laughs> yeah. And so with a lot of crypto, that there's a tremendous amount of of base effects at play. And so when you had you know a, a retail phenomenon like Bonk come out. Um, and you had a heavy short base in, in a name like Solana where funding was really negative and um, it, it tends to cause squeezes Yeah. because it's like, okay, I have a $20 million short on, it goes from $8 to $12, right? I've just lost 10 million bucks <laughs> out of thin air. Right. Um, and so For that what feels like a small move in Seoul small. historically. I mean, the thing yeah. was at 200 a year ago. If but it goes from eight to 12, like that's right, not that's a big a, that, deal. But it's a 50% but move. 50% move. Right. And so there's a lot of base effects at, at play here, particularly in the alts. And so what you've had happen over the past week is anything where, where people were short, especially stuff, you know, where base effects are, are very relevant, um, that stuff got squeezed and you led, led to forced liquidations during periods of low liquidity. Yep. And that broadly caused the market they to rally. They go back and buy back their shit and if they're mm -hmm. physically short. Um, yep. A classic short squeeze. Um, so um, and so the, it doesn't feel fundamental. Let's no, put it that Fair way. enough. Fair enough. And the bonk, um, the bonk, but, you know, the fundamental, well, hold on. First on bonk. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, kind of an interesting project in, in this way that I'll say, which is this is a meme coin, but it was airdropped to NFT holders yep. on Solana. Yep. Um, the team, I guess, had an allocation for themselves, but they burned it, provably. Yes. So it becomes a fair launch dog meme coin at uh, that rallied, you know, some excitement, at least to use the chain, right? You'd go out on chain yeah. and get it or whatever. And you could see this in on chain data on Solana. It was There was a lot of activity around this. Yeah. Um, at a time when they desperately needed some, 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 you know, some a shot hopium. in the arm. Yeah, some hopium. Um, so, but it really, I mean, some will say, I mean, what can you do with Bonk, right? Nothing. It's useless, right? I mean, that's, but, and this has been the argument from some Web3 investors that I know where they say like, but the token itself can create, even if it's only a token, think about the word token, literally means like a placeholder, right? Mm -hmm. Even if that's all it is, it can be used to incentivize and energize a community, which is interesting. It appears to have been what had happened here. Um, yeah, no, I mean, 
It's not going to like energize smart money. No. It's not going to energize and, and, and like when, large pools of capital to move into the space. And when the knockoffs come out, like bank, bunk, bunk, bunk right? Yeah. They're not going to do anything. But so yeah. it's it's not a it's not a uh, bullet you can fire that often as a community to. But it but there was a lot of activity there. I think that uh, that's yeah. Right. I mean that that was the catalyst. And then the fundamentals, mm-hmm. you know, with a lack of you know for sellers in other assets like Bitcoin and stuff. Yep. I mean it, it's it, yeah. Where is where the, is the pain trade? Uh, it, it's higher. It's higher. It's, it's higher for for sure. Um, I think there's been a lot of de-risking that that that's happened. Um, people have gotten positions down to their bare bones, essentially. Most crypto native folks that I talk to um, that you know deploy capital in this space um, have been very cautious um, and defensively positioned. That's the same for basically you know all risk assets for yeah. the most part. Um, and so the, the pain trade's definitely higher. I mean, if you just think about it, like if ETH in the first 10 days of the year is up, you know, 10%, right? There's probably a lot of guys that don't have it on in size and they you know, they're, 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 you know, investors are going to be like, okay, ETH's up 12% in 10 days of the year. You're only up two. Like what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, there, there, there's some of that at play. Um, but broadly speaking, um, I think the the macro backdrop has been fairly constructive to to start the year. You know, last week we had the soft, um, you know, uh, ISM figures that that caused the market to rally. The soft average hourly earnings figures, mm-hmm. and so the the macro backdrop has been okay. And then if you think about what crypto was doing to to start the year, there was so much bad news that came out. Um, you know, to start the year, there's the the OCC stuff, the Voyager Binance investigation. I mean, the, 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 it was yeah. literally like endless. Uh, the drip, and, drip on FTX and drip, related drip, stuff, etc. And the market couldn't go down. Right, right. It tells you seller exhaustion. Yeah. Right. And so the moment you had any bit of g- good in the in the space, that caused you know short liquidations yeah. and, and prices to rally, etc. Yeah. I mean, I, I I've been saying this um, that if you're not when you talk about how it couldn't go down, right? These things have a large and dedicated group of people that believe in them own them uh, yeah. want to build on them use them and at some point there there is a floor yeah there's a floor and um i've said for a long time that uh, there's a cult of decentralization that's part of what is driving this is a social movement no absolutely um, and there are sub movements in inside it obviously with different goals and and roadmaps but like this is broadly more than simply a technology or an asset no i i, I mean i think every single you know, investor or, you know, person that thinks about this space, you know, in a critical way is yeah. definitely focused on that. I mean, you just think about the events of the year, right? How the dollar was basically used as as a weapon this year, mm-hmm. right? They shut off all the the oligarchs, the the financials for, you know, all the all the Russian banks. And the Chinese are looking at that and being like, okay, well we have to like de- diversify, de- diversify yeah. et cetera. And basically everybody, right? Right. Um, and they've all been, by the way, all the global central banks have been buying gold. Uh, been stacking a, a, gold. A couple, yes. Not all, they, a couple. they 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 have been, and I think that's totally reasonable. But I tell you that if they already had Bitcoin on their balance sheet, they'd be stacking Bitcoin. Yeah. It's just because, like, they have gold. They have gold. And it's also the Chinese are a big driver of it. And they're obviously not, you know, pro decentralization. (laughs) Right. Uh, And so, you know, like, there's a lot of folks thinking very critically about money, the decentralization of it. Um, And ultimately, I do think. That puts a floor on 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 Bitcoin, right. right? If you have, if you're some Saudi billionaire or you know some some rich guy, you're you're constantly afraid of governments taking your money, you not having paid your taxes, etc. Um, you're, if you're a sovereign state, you're worried about you know sanctions, inflation, and sanctions geopolitics, yeah, all of that. And so there is a, a real place for decentralized money. Yeah, non-sovereign, um, not sound yep. money is a is a use case. And 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 the bigger it is. And the more liquid, the more credibility it has. It becomes self-fulfilling, right? Um, Etc. And I also think that one of the reasons, like you know, when Bitcoin was taking off, like, and and one of the properties of money that that you like a lot is, is stable value, right? The longer that Bitcoin can hover around seventeen thousand, eighteen thousand, whatever. Um, and hold its value, the more constructive, you know, the argument is. And, like, that's what you want in money anyway. It's yeah. something that stores value well. 
Um, you know, I think in prior periods in the market, it's it's been it's traded like a very speculative asset, and that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, just even think about the dollar. I mean, there were points where dollar yen had moved thirty percent in a year, and like Bitcoin moving down sixty five percent. Isn't that crazy in right. the context of things? Uh, but taking a step back, the one lesson that I would give folks about regular currencies and G ten FX in general. Um, which are, you know, the mm-hmm. 10 of the most prominent currencies out there and throw in dollar China and, you know, a couple other EMs. Uh, but currencies are historically one of the biggest mean reverting assets on the planet, right? They will swing up and down in value, but you take a look at the 30 year chart of some of these currencies, they're right back to where they were 15 years ago, right? They, the ranges for currencies have already been established, except, you know, EM that just, you know, dollar EM Some just stuff goes, crazy. goes up a lot, a lot yeah. et cetera. But in this, in the current world, um, you know, I, I think it's it's fairly reasonable to expect currencies to, to be mean reverting for a while. And once you have critical mass in Bitcoin, it's going to behave that way it is, you know, what I'm thinking in, in, in the long run, five, 10 years down the line. Yeah. So, you know, Bitcoin back to 30K in two years, like that's so easy yeah right like if you establish a, tr- a range of 30 to 60 like that wouldn't be that crazy either yeah. um and so in a year where you've moved 65 percent and in a year where inflation is going the other way now most likely uh we can get into that a little bit later but we're probably going to see a negative month on month print this month yeah so that's tomorrow uh, we're recording on wednesday yep Tomorrow CPI is published, mm-hmm. and then this comes out Friday. So yeah. hello Friday. Um. <laughs> but yeah, so so you're having you know dollar weaken this to start the year. Yields move lower, stocks move higher. There's been an unwind of what was happening last year. Yeah, and so I think it's totally fair to make a prediction that you'll see a little bit of a reversal in, in Bitcoin as well in, in that kind of context. Yep. yep. Um, right. If the dollar sells off by ten to fifteen percent, you should like, see some. Yeah. Some. Absolutely. Feedback into 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 Bitcoin. So CPI tomorrow. What yep. are, what are the what are we expecting here? So it's very interesting. Um, CPI. There are a couple of things that matter about CPI. Or there's a lot of things. <laughs> but in terms of like what I'm focused on as a trader is a, a couple of things, right? One, where expectations are. Yeah. Not just the number, right? right. If Stuff if it comes in above expectations versus lower than expectations, that's going to dictate most of the, the ball game, right? That's for, the ball for, game for, for, for the term. move on the day. Yeah, for the on the day movie, right? And so what's been happening is that uh, a bunch of sell side institutions have been forecasting um, a lower number than what the economists uh, were forecasting officially on, on on Bloomberg, and so you've seen the Bloomberg month on month headline number go from zero. Yeah. Um, to like neg point one. So and and mm-hmm. I see. So so the so now the Bloomberg the 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 expectation is, is for a softer, softer, and the, the so expectations have been moving lower over the past week. And I think that's totally reasonable given the the data, the data set that that we yeah. have. You know, one of the things is like just gas prices, right? Again, they've been moving down from November and December. That's a huge. That's one. one you can see on the Chevron or, or whatever sign as you drive by. Yep, absolutely. And, and you drive by every day and you notice that it goes lower. I mean, that's something everyone – that makes everyone – that's actually one – it's like that is one of the really interesting uh, – inflation is so driven by like personal behavior, right? Like yeah. if people think things are expensive, they might buy less. I mean they, expectations uh, for inflation are just as important right. as inflation. And this is a billboard that people all around the country see every day. That is their own personal check mark or, or sort yeah. of where they can follow inflation, quote unquote. And Absolutely. When gas gets cheaper. That has a feedback loop into tons of, of other stuff. things. Yeah. And also expectations of, of exactly. where people think in, inflation is yeah. going to be. Um, but in my head, and you know, the way I think about inflation is it comes down to a handful of things, right? Rents, owner's equivalent rent. The Fed has uh, recently published a paper um, about how uh, – CPI right now is, is sort of lagged in terms of how it looks at, at rents, and they have a new index. I forgot what it's called, but essentially, it's already suggesting a slowdown in, in rents. And home prices have obviously um, sort of topped out and are moving in in the right direction. So I think housing and and rent, you know, you're probably safe in, in that it's headed in the right direction. And that isn't something that causes CPI to go higher. Right. I mean, it, it could, but Tomorrow, it won't I mean. be as relevant right. because you know that it's backward looking and right, the right, forward looking right. and more right. high frequency sort of data points it. suggest that it's constructive, right? Um, and then um, you have sort of the consumer goods. 
right? And the consumer goods have been trending in, in the right direction and having gas prices move, move lower are, are going to help them. And so the la you know, one of the, the areas that we've been most concerned with that have been sticky has been in, in, in services pricing, right? Like things like uh, medical goods and like, you know, leisure and hospitality services and, and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Those prices have been, you know, relatively sticky. Um, but we, what we had last Friday was, you know, ISM services um, that printed below 50 and showed contraction, right? We also had um, average hourly earnings, right, uh, that moved lower. And so, you know, taking a step back, labor, the, the, the growth in, in wages is also a key sort of component of, of our understanding of inflation. Mm -hmm. And that's also been moving lower. Right. In terms of not moving lower, but the month on month increases have been coming, coming down, down yeah. to, to reasonable levels. The growth has been right. Receding. So, correct. Yeah. Right. So it's one thing to have a really tight labor market in terms of, you know, jobs outstanding and unemployed people. Uh, but it's it'd be another to have like everybody's getting five, 10 percent raises. Right? right. And so the fact that you're seeing the the, the wage side of the, the inflation pressure is also moving down, you know, that's good. Um, and then, you know, with this CPI print, like you have like, you know, used autos and things of that nature. So you want to see broad weakness. Yeah. And I think the market is set up to for that, that right yeah. now. But I worry that there are the risk is is that it comes in flat or right. a bit higher than expected. Expectations are now very low. low I see your exactly. point. This is the good setup for that. So I think a, expectations have been anchored to the downside. Yeah. And also, like if it misses by, by a little bit to the downside, which is good, right? Because expectations have already started to move and the trend, it might not impact markets that 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 much. Right. Uh, but taking a step back, we're at the point now where basically, you know, housing, inflation, Core goods, inflation, you know, consumer goods, some of the services stuff is probably going to start to turn. The labor side of, of the equation is starting to move in your favor. And this is going to be the third straight decline in CPI. And it looks like we've we've topped out, right? So you, you hit a peak and it's been moving lower and lower um, in a gradual way. And so the inflation picture in the U.S. is, is getting a lot better. And that's kind of what you're seeing in the market mm -hmm. in terms of pricing. Um, and it's led to a, a bit of a discrepancy between what the, the market is pricing and versus what the Fed is pricing. There's about a 15, 20 basis point discrepancy in terminal rate expectations. And then there's a, a bigger discrepancy in terms of when the Fed's expected to start cutting right. versus um, you know what the what the Fed's telling you, which is they're not cutting at all in this 2023. This is that great debate, right? Um, it's, the, it's, a, it's the great debate right now. The market now. versus the Fed on rates. And yeah, yeah it's going to be really interesting. It does. Um, it feels like the second half of this year uh, for risk investing is when is when a lot of people are feeling like rates will have paused. And, and yeah. you said markets even pricing perhaps cuts in Q4. Yeah. Um, but that we still have both perhaps generally in markets, but also in crypto, the first you know, bit of this year um, feels like a continuation of a bit of the slog that we've been in. Yeah, no, range, I, range I mean, I, I, I think you're totally right. And, but my one worry about it is just it's just so consensus. Yeah. Right. It's like everybody's like, oh, you know, inflation is going to fall. Then Fed's going to change its tune back half of the year. Risk <laughs> assets are going to rally. It seems like too good a story, you know. So good. Guys, I, I just worry about that because this inflation thing, it's like it's sticky and it's scary inflation it, it, it's the the one thing that i would say is different than other prior periods there've been a lot of folks doing like historical studies about like yeah. you know how is this is the 70s style is this great depression like you know, been a lot of historical analysis right? right 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 and i think the biggest things that people are missing are one the excess reserve environment uh, what I mean by that is the amount of money that's just floating in the system that's just been printed over the past decade, right? You're talking about abundant levels of excess reserves. There is no scarcity of dollars, right? There's, you know, there's two and a half, two point three trillion dollars in the reverse repo facility, right? That is money that has to literally get drained out of the system because it doesn't want to buy any assets, <laughs> right? It's it's excess, you know, reserves that, that are in the banking system, and so. There's a lot of money in the in the system that's just idly waiting there to get deployed, yeah. right? Once they get the signal from the Fed to deploy, right? Right, and then you have this this you know crazy investor like fervor in in the U.S. where the moment it's risk on, it's 
you know, pile in. meme stocks like crazy. I mean, the <laughs> meme stocks today are, are, are ripping. Are they really? I didn't they see are, that. Right. Yeah. And you'll see the same stuff. You're like, right. you'll, like you'll start a speculative frenzy the moment the Fed like turns around. And then it's like, OK, interest rates move lower. And it's like demographically, like. People still want to buy houses, right? right? If if home mortgage rates go from seven to five, people are so going to buy. People are going to start buying again, right? Man, it's hard and to then, unwind and this, then, huh? And, and then the other, the other most important part of this that people are really missing is the labor market. You're talking about three point five percent unemployment rate. If you want a job, you basically have it, right? And you're getting a good job because you're getting raises, etc. But like, it's not like you know, you have that much room to go lower, right? If people have jobs, if they're stuck in 30-year mortgages that they got on two handles or low threes, right? Like, people are going to spend money. They're going to feel fine. And the moment stuff goes back the other direction... It could go hard. It could go... The inflation cycle could could just resume. Yeah. And so, like, I, I think people are dramatically underestimating how quickly inflation can pick back up once the Fed starts to turn. Because right now, I look look at the data set, et cetera, and everybody's like, oh, stuff's slowing down, et cetera. And then I'm like, well, did you look at consumer spending in Q4? It's up. It's up. Right? It's high, it's, right? It's up. Like nominal growth is expected to be high. Like, like home prices haven't fallen off that much. Right. Yeah, you have like used autos. That point you down. make though really scares me and it's totally right because the second the everybody says, oh my gosh, it's time to redeploy and do more stuff. Oh, the rates are going to come down. Then that that counteracts the whole mission of the Fed and could cause it. And, and, and this is the thing you're talking about the historicals, right? In the 70s, like they tried to get inflation under control and failed multiple times before Volcker had to like drop the hammer, right? And absolutely. Um, um, that is a fear. Um, well, and, look, and like that's what the Fed's afraid of and that's why they're like so like aggressive about hammering home the point that they're not cutting yeah. in yeah, this yeah. year. And that's like what they have to do because it's always politically convenient to and make markets rip. And it's also um, about expectations. So they're trying yep. to control expectations. Um, we're going to keep this story going, man. This is going to be an interesting year. Um, so uh, I'll look, yeah. look forward to it. So that's that's it for now. BIMNET, BB Galaxy Digital Trading. Thank you so much. Quick break for our listeners. As you know, we love audience participation. So if you have any questions for us, you'd like us to answer suggestions or feedback, hit us up on social, on Twitter, GLXY Research, or email us, research at galaxy.com. Um, as you know, we mostly have internal guests from Galaxy on this show. We have a great one coming up in a few seconds. Jason Urban, head of trading at Galaxy. It's going to be a great conversation. He has a lot of experience in markets and insight, um, and you're going to enjoy that a lot. But if you would like to suggest other guests for this show, um, internal or external, hit us up with that as well. And we'd love to hear from you as always. That's it. Let's get into the interview with Jason. Let's go now to Jason Urban, head of trading at Galaxy Digital. Great to see you, Jason. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here, Alex. This is great. Yeah, it's a long time coming. Um, <laughs> I was going to have you on, you remember, during the FTX yep. uh, thing when we thought it was merely interesting. Then it turned into the debacle <laughs> that it became, yes. and you were indisposed. Uh, there there, there were Galaxy. more pressing issues at the moment. <laughs> there were, yeah. So, But it's great to have you here. Um, for our audience, Jason runs trading at Galaxy, one of our five business units, and um, it's an important one. And But I want to get into it with Jason because, you, first of all, you've been in markets for a long time. And we're going to talk about Jason's backstory and how he got started in the options markets. Um, and then we'll talk about how he got into crypto and, um, and you know, some we'll talk about crypto. So, But let's start it. You, 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 uh, what was your first job in markets? So I, I took a job out of, out of college, ended up with Goldman. Uh, and they were in the analyst program and they were like, well, we bought this company in Chicago that's into options. And I really liked options. I was trading options through, through college a little bit. And, and so we went out there and it was Hull Trading, which was the, the algorithmic trading business, but it was also a markets, floor markets based business. And they're like, well, you're big and you're new. And Phys- so you mean physically tall, physically tall. <laughs> like, 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 that's, you know, that, that's the interesting thing about the pits. It's, I always joke that. You know, so I, so I'll, I'll tell you the so I, I went there. I spent about eh, six or seven years down in the in the pits, 
um, and then came upstairs and started doing that. But but that that period of time in the in the crowd, you know, it's one of the places where phys- physical size matters, location to people, because it is it's like yelling at someone in a crowded subway. Right. And it's one of the very few places where you can still solve a problem with your fists. If it ever, <laughs> if, it ever if it ever devolved to that, where you know you can like I said I said buy him, you said sold. No, you know, like we're gonna hash yeah. this out right here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like people get separated, and there's you know it, it, it gets. <laughs> A little chippy you know it's, yeah. it's, it's an interesting dynamic because you're in a lot of ways it's a lot like crypto you're you're in competition with the person that you stand next to for eight hours a day that you literally are are hip to hip with them for eight hours there is no secrets you know there is no anything and so you, you you naturally talk to them but then all of a sudden at the drop of a hat something would happen and you're both competing for the same thing and so somebody who's your your dear friend 5 minutes ago and sharing wonderful stories about oh your your baby did this to like 2 minutes later i hope you die in a in a pit and i want to i'm going to i'm going to get that trait so it was you know a very different yeah. a very different do thing do those do the pits exist like that anymore i it's, truthfully i don't know i think they were they were dying for for years and years, and I think that when COVID happened, that was kind of the end of it. Um, but it was uh, it was an interesting time because you had to think really fast on your feet. Like there was no, you know, like now if, if you're not sure on something or you want to triple check something, right. you you have the opportunity to, to, to look at a screen and buy yourself 30 seconds. Down there, there was no buying time. Yeah. And the person was right next to you. Now it was great for market color and understanding things. Right. It was terrible for being on the spot. Like if you, if you made a mistake, like, and your word is your bond down there. Sold means sold. And, yeah. you know, like there is no hiding. Like if you screw somebody, you're, you've screwed them for life. Right. Because it's a person right there yeah. in your face. Like that you know that you're going to see out <laughs> Every on the street, day. some like like with their family at brunch, like crazy things. So, so what were you trading primarily? S&P options. So evolved. So we were yeah. we were at the cutting cutting edge of, you know, as we we evolved, we you know, we the time Goldman invented the tradable VIX, so then we were trading VIX versus listed, and then we started doing variant swaps and other things. And so we just, you know, financial engineering and you know, vol arb across yep. multiple multiple products. Do you ever do uh, anything in commodities? Yeah, I you know it, you know we we've talked a, a little bit you and I out of here, but m- when I left Goldman in 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 '09 after the crisis to go and, and basically start the equities business at DRW with a with a group of my team, and while I was at DRW, it was a, a tremendously entrepreneurial place, kind of like Galaxy that you could try. You were given the leash to try things if it made financial sense, and. Without getting into a crazy long story, we ended up. I have a rail car business outside of this business that I, I, I do. rail cars, rail cars, railroads, like rail, rail, just well, you not see the roads, them, the cars. Yeah, you see them with the spray paint on. Those are usually <laughs> <laughs> you own those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, just the ugly ones. Um, and and so we were talking about moving corn from low basis to high basis, and that trade, and some you know one of my rules, and it's a rule in GDT, always be nice. Yeah, if you're nice. People want to do things with you. It's, it's really easy. You could have a choice to be nice or mean. So I was always nice. And I was talking to this old farmer one day. And I was like, I really want to get corn from low basis in central Nebraska to the high basis. It was trading 50% below the futures market in, in central Nebraska in the spot market. And it was trading 50% above the, the futures market yeah. in Arizona. And I was like, I'm trying to find a way to get the corn from central Nebraska to Arizona, and I'm going to make 100% of my money net of transportation costs. Yep. And, the, you know, we're trying to get the numbers to work. And, and the farmer the farmer says to me, you want to know how to get corn from low basis to high? You want to know how to get six pounds of corn from central Nebraska to, to Arizona? And I was like, yeah, how do you do it? You know, like I thought he was going to tell me some secret. And <laughs> it's like you walk it out on four legs. And I said, walk it out on four legs. What do you mean? He goes, well, it takes six pounds of corn to make one pound of beef. Six pounds of corn costs 72 cents. One pound of beef trades at $1.29. So this will tell you when this was. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so he's like, you take the six pounds, you feed it to a feeder cattle. They grow. They make, they turn the six pounds of corn into one pound of beef. And then you sell it for $1.29. And that's how you do it. And then you can move the, the cattle wherever you want. You put them on a truck wow. and, and send them. And so I was like, wow, that's, you know, you're, you're right. And then all of a sudden you started thinking about, you know, the impact to that, so then it led to a, a pig farm, you know, oil and gas, and 
you know, you name it. It kind of, it kind of spirals. So in addition to trading vol and trying to figure out, you know, forward forward starting variant swaps, we were also like, you know, do we want to buy the Black Angus or are we going with the, the White Hereford on this on, on this batch? Totally different, like Love keeping that. your brain just a little bit, which is what led me to crypto in a lot of yeah. ways because at DRW there were about 10 or 12 of us that ran the different business units and we were having a, a dinner one night where, where the, the person that I was running the cattle business with, we brought all the, the different you know, we had the same kitchen prepare the same cut of meat from either grass-fed, corn-fed, non-hormone treated, all the different kinds. And we're saying, we're going to do a taste test. And it's going to be cooked by the same chef. The same way, same, control same environment. Same way, everything. And so we had the 10 people, we had a little room, was the end of the year type of yeah. type of. So this know, is a state dinner, but it's a it's a research project it, it as was, well. It, that's exactly what it was both. Yeah. And so you're, I was sitting there talking to the, the guy next to me, and this is before Cumberland was really a thing at DRW. Yep. And... The guy sitting across from me, and he'll remain nameless, he turns to his buddy and he says, I just bought 200,000 ETH for a quarter. <laughs> now, I didn't know what ETH was, but I, when you're at a dinner with, with 10 traders and somebody says, I bought 200,000 of anything, you, you like, it's like a record scratch. You pay attention. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like, I was like, hold, hold on a second. I said, XYZ, what did you just do? He said, I bought 200,000 Ether for a quarter. Now I'm doing commodity stuff. So I'm like, and I joke in the like, so, so are you a dentist? Like, what are you, like, <laughs> yeah, the, the, gas? the gas? And he's like, no, like Ethereum. Thousand. You know, I yeah. bought 200,000 Ethereum for a quarter. So, you know, that was, you can figure out what year that was. And, you know, at first I, I discounted it. I was like, oh, yeah, this crazy internet money. And <laughs> I made the mistake in the, in the, in the late 90s of discounting the internet. I said, you know, people, the internet's great. You get your AOL disc in the mail and you plug it in. And, yeah. You get 50 of those discs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, Encarta, you know, yeah, yeah. like all of that. And I was yeah. like, you know, oh, that's just going to be, you know, it's great for internet and, you know, watching porn or whatever, but no one's going to do commerce. Now I come right. home every day and there's 50 Amazon boxes. Right. So I, I said, I'm never going to make that mistake again where I missed something because I was, I was too myopic in my thought process. So after I kind of laughed at this guy and made a few jokes, few jokes <laughs> about, you know, oh yeah, sure. EMP is going to happen where's your money now <laughs> yeah exactly. uh, i went home and i started learning about it and that was what opened me up to, to crypto um personally yeah and then professionally was watching what we were doing on the cumberland side of the house at drw and as i thought through i was like this is here to stay this is for real we know what's going on in the in the broader financial markets and i looked at the ecosystem and i said what is it that we can, I can trade. And at that, at that time it was still very easy to arb. You could buy twos here and sell sixes over there yeah. and make your nice four bucks and, and walk away. You can do that all day. I was like, but the large organizations like Galaxy are going to eventually get into this and it becomes a, a black box game, a money game. Mm -hmm. I said, but the lending game, I don't see the lenders stepping in here for a very long time. I have a much longer runway to start a business. And that was, I think, where you and I, when I started Drawbridge Lending. When we first lending, met each and, other. And yeah. we met each other, and you were at FIDO, and I was yeah. out, you know, hanging out a shingle trying to, trying to you know, <laughs> raise money. And Galaxy was one of those investors. Right. And, you know, over time, it just became, it made a lot of sense, given structured products, derivatives, lending, all the things that we were doing here, that instead of me being a large client of the firm, it made sense to kind of roll that together. Yeah. And that was, that was how I ended up here. Yeah. So, what a, what a great story too! And I mean, I'm laughing about the steak dinner and the, and the cows do this. But wait, so did you end? By the way, I'm a big. Uh uh, I, I I love beef. Did they? Did you end up coming out with what was the best cut on that one? By the way, do you remember? You know what? The, I do. There were two. So we the one that we weren't doing, which was clearly the best cut, was Wagyu. Yeah. So we had they had that in the in the, the and they brought it out. Undisputed champion, but, but 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 the one that was surprisingly the best. Yeah. Was and it was you know consensus you know most was was the Holstein, which is a which is a milk cow. Oh wow. And. They're really they, they're primarily sold to, to Walmart, and what that is is, which is interesting, is they've genetically engineered the 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 Holstein to produce when the when the when the mother births, it's like ninety percent females because it replenishes the the milk producing herd, but there's ten percent that are males, and they don't you know in the old days they they would literally it was inhumane they would take them out back and shoot them, oh my God. and then somebody said well I'll just take them for free right. And then they started feeding them for free, and you could sell them for ground beef to McDonald's or whatever. And then somebody, then there became a real market, and by the time I was in it, it was already kind of a, becoming a real market. Um, you know, and there's some interesting, some interesting things. So the Holstein was the best tasting of all. Wow! Of them. So all right. 
That was, you know, if you <laughs> buy your steaks at Walmart. All right. I love to hear it. <laughs> um, okay, Jason. So just a couple more things. Let's talk about crypto a little bit. I mean, yep. uh, just yeah, enough, enough for the cattle. <laughs> let's talk about what we really care about. Yeah. Well, let's get to this year. Um, or I guess I even say the yeah. last, we'll say the last year. Um, I mean, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, you've been in, in these markets for a long time. I have too. I mean, what was your just impression on the, the feel of the bear market year, if we call it part of a bear market cycle, although of course there was black swan after black swan. Well, yeah, it, you know, it, it was interesting because you know one, you know, three black swans become a flock. Yeah, <laughs> right? we got a whole... at, at that point. So after the first one, it was. I think like... we're going to call it a murder, which is uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, what is crows. a flock of crows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, not for us. It's been a very, very fortuitous, fortuitous year for us in a lot of ways. Um, you know, at, when the first one happened, you're like, okay, we've seen this before, and it's it's you know, the, the terror ordeal. Um, and you knew there was going to be more that kind of shook out of that. You didn't know who, but you can't destroy, you know, $20 billion of value and not have somebody take a little bit of hit. So three arrows came along and we were, you know, we, we were doing business there and we were very, we were very quick to, to make adjustments right. and, 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 and move that, move our business in the right direction there. Um, and you thought, okay, that that's it. You know, there might be a little bit more. And then obviously this this most recent. Well, you had, and you had the lenders to the other lenders, the non drawbridge lenders. Yeah. All, all suffered. Um, <laughs> well, and it's it's interesting because in the early days, you know, yeah. I, I was thinking back. There was a panel that I did. I want to say it was in 2018, and it was me, uh, Mike Morrow, and Alex Mashinsky on the panel. And I was thinking, like, I was the little fish at the time because right. we were the the smaller of the the smallest. Of right. the three lenders, and Genesis and, was, and, and Celsius. Yeah, yeah, and I and I was and I was saying to myself, like, you know, you look back on that. I wish I had a picture of that panel. <laughs> yeah, you know, the three of us sitting there, and I just remember Mashinsky just talking over me the entire oh time, God. and I'm like, Alex, enough. Like, I, I mean, yeah. you, know, you know. So, so those um, guys, then um, a lot of that was also fallout or just general mismanagement, obviously, as it looks yeah. like from the bankruptcy proceedings and some of those. But um, then FTX. I mean, what was the I mean, this was a, this was, I was here, you, I mean, we, yeah. we lived that. It was a traumatic week. I mean, I think if our audience goes back and listens to our episode on uh, <laughs> the week of no, uh, uh, November 7th or whichever yeah. day, Friday that is, um, you'll hear a 25 minute rant from me about how mad I was at FTX and am still, but um, what was your sense there? I mean, that was the, it turns out, right. We think they, they were underwater half a year earlier yeah. maybe and covering it up right yeah you know and it, it was funny because and there's nothing funny about it but it was if you had asked us collectively as an industry you know who are who are some of the titans of your industry it turns out that one of them was was just a a, a fraud yeah and and that that's the hardest thing to to risk manage against you can risk manage against market moves you can risk man you can read people when they mismanage when someone's that good at, at defrauding people it, it was tough yeah. and that, and that's not to that, that's not to to hide myself from responsibility for any, you know yeah. what 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 happened but it was it was certainly you you asked how I felt about this. Like yeah. when it first started, it felt like some of the other times in in the crypto. The you know, anytime. Yeah, anytime you have yeah. an emerging technology, and I was reading up, speaking of railroads, about some of the railroad things that happened in the 1890s and the early 1900s, and how you had this new revolutionary technology that's going to change the way people do things, the way mm -hmm. commerce is done. You do get this. You get these manias. You get these. Right. And, and it takes time to work its way through the system. So I, I, when it first started happening, I was like, okay, this is another one of these. It's a cyclical this, bubble in crypto. Right. And, and, and we need to grow up collectively as an industry and create some rules, whether it's SRO, self-regulatory organization, or, or things of that. But, but this is part of that process. We're all going to get to where, right. where I thought we should have been when I started Drawbridge and we had to the approach we took relative to the right. competition was like a measured, responsible thought process around asset-backed lending. And I said, okay, this is this is part of that. And then it just kind of kept going. And by the time you hit, you know, you hit November and, and the FTX debacle, it was, um, it was like, okay, this this is it. Like like we like as you've come in in the heat of the battle, mm -hmm. you just it's just survival. Right? I remember. Like you're in the fog of war. You're not you're not really you're not worried about like did I make the right career choice and just or the what? Scale of the rugging from yes. them and and right the 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 brazenness. It wasn't oh they 
you know, the business didn't work out and it's a, it was a, it was taken out by the market forces. This was apparently a giant theft. So we need, um, what, you know, I, I think we, I said on that FTX week episode that we want decentralization. That's why a lot of us got involved in this space, obviously. Yep. Um, but if you're not going to be decentralized, let's say you're not a protocol, you're a company, um, you better be open, transparent, audited, and I would like it to be regulated, I think, the way companies are. Oh. Um, and we need that transparency from from centralized firms. Um, so I don't know, but then you look at the Congress, what's going to be a pretty humorous like gridlock there. Um, it's So I, I don't know if we're going to get a lot of actual movement on these various proposals that have been made to clarify for the US um, how businesses can operate in these markets. like. At, a, at scale, right? So I, it's we're at an interesting time. I think we're unlikely to see that clarity anytime really soon. Yeah, I agree with that. And and you're and you're right. Like regulation is so important and we embrace it, right? Like like I know that if you just tell us what the rules are, that we will be successful in what we choose to do. But we need to know the rules. And I right. think the problems that we've had have been there are no rules. And so firms like ours who have taken a a more um measured approach in certain areas. Well, like, I mean, we try to run it like there are rules. We, yeah. We, like we, what we think the rules should be. Should be. And or, 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 using, or using the existing rules in other markets as a, exactly, as as a, a corollary. Yeah. You know, the, these are the guardrails. Right. But, but it was frustrating for, there, there, there were times where there was a period of time where I was like frustrated. I was like, I'm watching my competition do things that I know is wrong, that I know is profitable for them in the moment that we, we would like, I, I wouldn't, would even, ask, I wouldn't right. even ask to do, but I was like, like, how do I, how do I compete? This is where, this is where the lack of a clear regulatory framework and policy harms U.S. innovation because yes. this sends people to the Seychelles and the, you know, wherever. Isle, Isle of Light, Isle, Isle, Isle of Man. Man. Remember the Isle of Man? <laughs> yes. um, a Gibraltar. And, where where like they can a, go and become the largest in the world and, and the regulated firms um, without the clarity can't participate in the, or offer the products that those growing firms are offering. Yeah. Um, or if they do, they find themselves in a gray area where they can't And, and plan. you run a lot of risk, and that's yeah. risk that we're not comfortable taking. As Something a like forty-two percent of all crypto startups that received funding last year, venture funding, are headquartered in the U.S. So there is a huge, huge impetus, in my view, for policymakers to do something here and make sure that we don't lose. Let's make sure that forty-two percent doesn't does, become twenty-two percent or ten percent. How many? How many people do you know? And I know, I know quite a few who were in the earlier days, the 17, 18 era, who have left the United States. People who a lot. were a lot. A lot. You know, we, we, we as the United States is, is a place that's the shining beacon on the hill, you know, to, to attract talent globally and to create innovation. That is what makes the U.S. Right. a special place, one of the many things. But when you think about that, if you're going to take that that innovative spirit, that that, you know, financial Darwinism, whatever you want to call it, and push it away because you can't figure out a set of rules to, to work with. Give us some rules and let's build on them. Right. Let, let, let's not, like, let's start with, a, you don't build, you don't, Rome wasn't built in a day. You're not going to build it all at once, but give us something. Yeah. Or let us, or let us, from a self-regulatory perspective, let us establish something. And then you tell us, like, no, this we should tweak this as opposed to yeah. coming in with draconian me measures that say, you know, Crypto is 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 not it's not evil. It can like like anything. Nuclear power is not evil. You can use it to make a bomb, or you can use it to run a city. Right. It's how you. It's what you do with it. Crypto and decentralization is innovation. It is progress. Yeah. Let's let let's embrace it. Let's not let's not kick it to the curb. Love that, Jason. Um, one last question. Uh, so we t looked back a little bit at the at the tumultuous twenty two. What are you thinking about twenty three? How does this feel? I know year to date. Markets look good, and, and but this is my joke, right? What are we on date eleven? We're recording this on Wednesday. I was like, year to date, we look great. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and 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 truly, like the business, like here's here's the the bittersweet bit of it from a galaxy perspective. We we are we are finally going to be recognized and are being recognized for being prudent, responsible risk managers and access to these markets. And people are finally saying, you know what? I still want to participate. And, and we are picking up a lot of share for that. Unfortunately, the size of the pie is is small right now because right. of, you know, we're at peak FUD 
in well, TradFi. Yeah. TradFi's view of crypto is peak FUD. And then m- macro and monetary policy y- stuff is. Yeah, there, there, there are definitely headwinds. So I, I think that from a, from a broader from broader crypto perspective, I think the first half of the year will be a slog. It's not going to be. I, I think the forced selling and the capitulation is 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 by the wayside. We might have one or two wicks lower, but nothing. Mm-hmm. I don't see a, a major retrenchment. Um, but I also don't see a lot of catalysts. I mean, you can look at you can look at what's happening with ETH, and maybe that will be a, a catalyst in, in in late spring. Um, but I think the second half of the year, you'll see the Fed start to to move, and you'll see the op- the markets start to 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 reshift again. And I think that at that point, crypto starts to make a lot of sense for mm-hmm. for people who are looking at that you know that fast money that's coming in and trying right. to to take advantage of things. I mean, it, I think it always makes sense in a prudent portfolio. Totally. But um, I, I think that the second half of the year will be where where the fun is. Yeah. I think right now, at least from a galaxy perspective, we have. We are gaining share, and we are going to continue to gain share, um, and position ourselves accordingly. And so, right now, it's it's build, 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 it and is. that's and that's what we're doing. We yep. are we are rolling out a variety of things in the coming weeks and months that I think will be exciting for the market and and required in the market. Yeah. And so that's really where we're at. I love that. Um, Jason Urban, head of trading at Galaxy Digital. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Galaxy Brains this week. What a great conversation with Jason. He's got so much experience in markets. I always love talking with him. Everyone have a safe and happy weekend, um, and we'll see you next week for Galaxy Brains. Thanks for listening to Galaxy Brains, the weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. If you enjoy the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. To follow Galaxy Research, sign up for our weekly newsletter at gdr.email, read our content at galaxy.com research, and follow us on Twitter at glxyresearch. See you next week.